Well, it's great to, uh, great to be back. I loved my time here at University of Florida and think of myself as a Gator first, second, and, and last. Um, gosh, I was listening to the introduction and it, I certainly sounded, I, it, the, my two reactions was that person sounds old and that person sounds like a professional student to me. But um, <laughs> anyway, I, you know, hopefully we, uh, we all are you know, li lifetime learning. I, I, I'd like to think that um, you know, your experience here will be just the beginning of your, of your learning experience, not only in terms of kind of your experiences and, and, and what you pick up from, from your jobs, but um, I'll tell you, as I've, as I've looked back on my career, one of the most important aspects of this, just as you've learned from each other in the classroom, is to try to maintain some, um, you know, some, some connection, you know, come back to a reunion and, and be involved. And um, I promise they didn't put me up to this, but um, donate a little something, you know, and they'll do that and just get in the habit of it. If you're up to your ears in school debt as I was, you know, give 50 bucks or 100 bucks or something your first year, just make it a habit. And the st school will, you know, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. They'll stay in touch with you and they'll make sure you get invited to things that will give you an opportunity to, uh, to network with your, your classmates and stay in touch. And if you're thinking about a job change or if you're thinking about another educational program, it's gonna give you a, you know, a network and a source of people to, to stay in contact with. So um, I promise that wasn't a, a, a paid commercial, um, but uh, I, I'm a believer. It, it is gratifying to, to come back. Um, I, um, I grew up in Florida and I remember having a discussion with my parents about college and I thought it was going to be a discussion and they said there, there isn't any discussion. University of Florida is the best school in the state. It's the best value in the country and you're going to University of Florida. And I said, but could we at least talk about it? And they said, well, we can talk about it, but unless you're planning on paying for 100% of your education yourself, we're supporting you if you, you know, partially supporting you if you go to the University of Florida. So, you know, I'm not sure I was thrilled about that at 17, but they turned out to be wiser than I realized uh, at, at the time. And, um, you know, it was a great experience here, and, and I took advantage of, um, I, are these, are you all, um, Master students at, at this stage, or we've got undergraduates as, as well. Okay, good. Because um, I, I mean, I, I think that um, you know, there's certainly some some uh, great uh, some great universities, um, and you know, not all of them are in Gainesville, but um, Gainesville offers so much. I mean, I enjoyed the sports and the outdoors activities, and you know, you know, everything that everything that it has to offer, and. If you look at the total package, I mean, it's a it's a great place where you can get a great education, but you can still um, you can still have a full university experience. You know, you can do you can have the Greek life if you want it. You have a fantastic sports program. I'm going to get a chance to see uh, Jeremy Foley tomorrow. He and I were friends when he was here. He was a student and he was a ticket director uh, many many years ago. And what the ticket director did for the athletic association is all the important alumni would call and put pressure on the athletic director, which was somebody a lot older than Jeremy at the time. And um, they would call Jeremy into his office and say, I don't know what to do with these guys. I've got this person who wants 50 yard line seats in this 40 and they, you know, they all give a lot of money and figure out where they sit. And so he had the unenviable task of trying to make the uh, affluent alumni that uh, gave a lot of money happy. And uh, that wasn't, uh, wasn't easy to do. But um, I guess I, um, I, I talked to, to to, to Wayne and staff a little bit about what you might be interested in, and I'll start with some things, but I'll be happy to redirect this. I had a chance to talk to um, uh, a few of the real estate students as, as, as well as a finance student um, uh, but before I came in, just a, a small group, which, which was nice, and um, there seemed to be a little bit of, of interest in kind of, you know, how I got from Gainesville to Abu Dhabi, which when I was in Gainesville, I didn't know where Abu Dhabi was nor what the United Arab Emirates was. And um, it was a, you know, it was an inter interesting path. Um, but I, uh, I, I came, I was an economics major here at, at Florida. My father was a, had an accounting firm and he was hopeful I would be a, a CPA and I let him down. Um, but, uh, but I really enjoyed the economics department. It had a lot of very strong uh, Chicago PhDs and, and um, I, to me, it was the most stimulating of the 
of, of, the, of the faculty base at the time. And I used to just, I used to pick professors. If I had a professor that inspired me, I just took whatever, you know, whatever he, um, whatever he uh, ended up teaching. So I, I guess my, my major ended up being dictated more by just kind of following inspiring teachers than it did choosing a, you know, choosing a path. And I'm not so sure as an undergraduate that's a bad idea. Um, but I had a great experience. I was telling the folks I met with earlier, uh, I did go to law school. I, I think I had a, certainly an open mind about law school, um, but it was, it was a bit of a default position. I was really toying around with the idea, maybe I'd try to go get a PhD in economics because I was pretty excited about um, that track when I was here. And um, the, uh, the law school at the time had a program where if you took an LSAT, um, and you were an undergraduate student at University of Florida, they would look at your grades and the courses you took and your, and your LSAT, and you could be admitted without making an application. So I didn't act, I'm one of the few people, there were only a few couple years I did that, but I, I guess I technically went to law school without ever applying to law school. But I got a letter one day that said, you know, please come to law school, and you know, it starts in, you know, next term kind of thing. And, and so, um, again, I just stayed on campus because I liked Gainesville so much, and uh, I had such a, a great experience. I did a lot of stuff in student government. Uh, I just remembered this. This is an interesting fact. I ran for president of the student body and lost. Um, so, um, but the uh, the alligator, the independent Florida alligator, was not happy with me because I had uh, I had the support of the Greek system at the time, and and that was kind of taboo. So, um, anyway, after doing a bunch of other stuff, I didn't end up uh, serving as, as president of the student body. But enjoyed the experience, and I learned things from that that. Uh, that continue to serve me. And I learned a lot about dealing with the press even back then that I use in my business. And, and in, the, in the business organizations other than our communications department, I'm probably one of the, I think myself as one of the better people with the press. And I think most of that I learned by getting beat up by the alligator when I was a student here. Um, so you never, you never know. Uh, you, you know, you, ne you never know. Um, I had a desire to, 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 to kind of work in finance, and um, I had the law degree and ended up kind of trying to transition over, and I, it, was, um, it really was a job strategy. I think I, 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 went, back to, I went back to business school because um, I was getting offers that I didn't think were, um, the position was more junior and the pay was less than what I thought I should get leaving the practice of law. And so I um, ended up going back to business school and it was really a, I guess as, in, as you would say clinically, maybe for a, a, a career transition. I think I could have done it without having done that, but I enjoyed the experience. Um, I went to a very small school for, for business. My business, um, um, my MBA program was 153, um, which was small from uh, some of the, you know, some of the, uh, uh, other programs and um, ended up going to work for Solomon Brothers at the time on 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 Wall Street and um, spent um, spent three or four years there had a had a great experience it was um, it was interesting to to feel some of the competition I I started in 1991 and um, I was focused on real estate and it was, that was not a very good time to look for a real estate job. That'd be like trying to get a real estate job in 2009 or 2008. It was a, it was a tough, tough period. And Solomon Brothers was, at that time, um, one of the real dominant uh, Wall Street players in real estate finance. What they had been, um, the breakthrough had been their, their uh, debt distribution. They were kind of the, the best, uh, they had the best debt distribution, bond distribution um, of the, on the street and had innovated mortgage securitization, commercial mortgage securitization. So that was the first um, organization at the time to take a, a building and write a mortgage and then split it up and sell it as a bond like, like is done in the residential side and the types of things that are very, very common today. But they were the originate, uh, innovators and originators of that. So they would take 30 or 40 freshly minted MBAs every year and so my timing was so great, I decided to come out, and they had decided that year they were going to cut, they were going to cut the, um, the class from 30 to 2. But I was fortunate I got one of the two positions, and um, there was another young guy that had gotten the other position, and he was nine years my junior, 
and he was a Baker scholar, or a Benjamin Franklin scholar from Wharton. Um, he had done an MBA. He had four years of work experience, and I think he was 20 at the time. And uh, they put us next to each other, and this was one of the smartest guys I had ever run across. And I remember going home telling my wife we were newly married and first child on the way, and I was up to my ears in school debt. And I said, I don't think I can make it. I don't think, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to make it on Wall Street. And she said, you know, why not? I said, there's like this 20-year-old like this kid, 19-year-old kid, whatever he is, he's, he's got four years of experience working for a Reed. He's got an MBA, like the top guy at Wharton. And um, ironically, we've, uh, we grew to be very good friends. And he runs, he was chief operating officer of, of iStar and runs a platform called H2 today. And we have three or $400 million of capital with him. And, uh, so um, I did survive, and uh, it was not as dark as I thought, and uh, that turned out to be one of my important relationships in, uh, in the business. Um, <clears throat> I um, had largely a domestic focus, had worked in New York, and got this inbound call from a headhunter, and I'd been in the business long enough to know um, the names of the major recruiters and the individuals at the major recruiters. And, I never heard of this person's name, and I never heard of the firm, and they were like, this is Sue somebody, and do you want to quit your job as a partner of Cerberus Capital and leave New York and move to the Middle East and work for a government? And I'm like, this is this ridiculous. I was sure it was a prank call. I think I may have you know, hung up the phone or something, and they were persistent, and they called back, and I didn't really know much about um, I didn't know much about sovereign wealth funds. I had raised five real estate funds up to that point in time, and I never had raised any money from a sovereign. I was kind of aware they were out there. I was aware that they had big checkbooks. I didn't know what they wanted, because they had obviously whatever I had to offer hadn't, hadn't appealed to them. And I'd raised a billion dollars or almost a billion dollars a couple of times. So I'd been a successful capital raiser, but I had never scratched the surface there. So again, um, I think when I started the, the, I won't say the interview process, the inquiry process for me, I was pretty sure I didn't want the job, but I thought this could be a good opportunity to learn something about this organization and organizations like them. I think as, as, the, as the sovereign world becomes more important sources of capital in the investment management world, you know, why not look under the hood and have an opportunity to see you know, what, that, what those organizations are like and how they would think. Um, and so I think that was really, um, really how it started. Um, then the, um, I, I was telling the, the, the gentleman and, and lady that I met, met with earlier, um, the organization had prepared for metamorphosis. They wanted to change the way they did business, which I'll talk about a little bit. But um, as part of that, they had recently started psychometric training. And I didn't know anything about it, uh, psychometric testing. I didn't know much about it. They hired a couple of PhDs. They were um, from top British schools. I think we had a Cambridge and Oxford guy. And they worked through a third party contractor. And they would put you through these battery of tests to kind of figure out your, your cultural fit, your quantitative and qualitative aptitude, and your conceptual reasoning and some of this kind of stuff. And um, so they asked me if I would take this test. And I didn't have any idea if I wanted the job. But I thought it would be pretty interesting, because I didn't know anything about those tests. So, you know, I continue to keep an open mind about just learning things that I don't know as much about as I would like. And um, so I, I s subjected myself to the testing in exchange for them sharing the, the data and me getting a little insight into, into myself. And, uh, you know, kind of fast forward, um, I become big believers in that type of testing. And, and um, it's something that I would, if and when you guys have opportunities to do that, I would encourage you to do it. Um, it's, it, 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 generate some amazing insight, and we use it very heavily. We've I've built out a team of um, about 150 real estate professionals, and um, every one of them went through that testing. And we test from the, you know, the 60-year-old to the entry-level uh, personal assistants. They all take it. It's slightly different for the assistants, the non-professionals, but similar in, in structure. So. Um, Anyway, I guess I'm trying to anticipate a few of the questions and tie a little bit of this story together. And then um, I'm certainly going to open this up because I'm really rather talk about what you want to hear than um, what I'm guessing you might want to hear. But um, the reason I ended up 
making the move and accepting the position was an opportunity to build something. Um, I'd really enjoyed what I had done. Um, I really had no interest in leaving Cerberus. Um, I had some workout experience and some cleanup experience, again, because of my legal background and had gotten into you know, all the messes. You know, I had done some good business that I had been part of originating, and then I was one of the people that got pulled in when we got in trouble. So when we bought Chrysler and when we bought General Motors Acceptance Corporation and, and some of these things, and the premise, you know, both, both of those investments didn't turn out to be um, good investments, but the premise was quite good because the idea was we were going to control about 70% market share of, uh, of automobile finance. And so the idea was that we could take the Chrysler Finance and the um, General Motors uh, Acceptance Corp and we could merge those and pull about a billion dollars of um, an overhead out of the combined structure. And um, all we needed to do was break even in the car business and, and the, you know, the multiple on the um, on the finance business was was um, you know was was going to be a fantastic investment. Well, car sales at the time were about 16 million, and I think they dropped to seven and a half million. So when uh, when uh, when they you know when things hit the brakes, it became very difficult, and there was a lot of workout experience, and um, we had five billion dollars behind home builders, and there was all kinds of stuff. So I had I had cleanup work that was going to keep me busy for the next at least five years, and I was enjoying it, and I was pretty good at it. Um, so I thought I would just stay, and I didn't really want to leave the U.S. I like New York, um, and uh, the idea of you know living in the desert a, a long way from friends and family wasn't the first thing that kind of came to mind. But the opportunity that presented themselves was to build something for the ground up, and um, you know I was skeptical as as we all should be. What's really the, you know I've had a lot of friends that have taken jobs to 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 go build something and. And they didn't have the resources. There was something necessary to, to the success that, that wasn't guaranteed, that wasn't there for sure. And so I asked a lot of questions about how serious they were about it. And they convinced me that they were. And, and they've put their money and, and their, their, their resources you know, where, the, where their mouth was. But uh, so for me, at the end of the day, I said, it, you know, it's, I won't work forever. And at some point, I'm going to look back on my career. And so what would be more gratifying? And my fear was, you know, I'm probably more fear motivated than, um, you know, than reward motivated at times. And, and my concern was that there would be an unbelievable opportunity to redesign the way sovereign wealth funds structured their business. The idea was to take a almost entirely externally managed platform and make it internally managed and build out the resources and support um, you know, to build Blackstone or to build Carlisle or something kind of for scratch. And um, nobody else called and asked me to do that. You know, I didn't have David Rubenstein say, you know, hey, you want to come rebuild Carlisle? But I had um, a group of people that were every bit as wealthy as he that said, we'd like you to come, move to this country, we'll put all the resources behind you, and you get to, you get to be one of the chief architects. And um, I said, I don't know how you pass that up. Because I thought about if it doesn't work out, I said, so what happens? I go over there, I hate it. I go over there, and they don't provide the resources, they said. They go over there, they provide the resources. I like it, but I'm not good at it. I thought through all of the things that might go wrong and thought, why? Why not? I mean, if it didn't work out, how long am I gone? A year, two, three? I don't know. And I do what? I come back to New York? I'm not going to have a problem getting a job back in New York. So all I did was you know, change venues for three years. And I, and I thought about my life, and a little piece of advice I'd give to you guys and gals, I, I think the things that I've regretted the most in my life are things I didn't do. It's never been things I've tried, whether I was successful or not, but those things that for whatever reason you don't quite have the, the I'm not saying you run out blindly, but if you've thought about things and you've, you've really done your, your due diligence and you've consulted the people you consult, I mean, those things that you don't do, those are the things that will haunt you a little bit. I mean, you've got your whole lives, your whole careers in front of you, and um, you know, you'll have a chance to make mistakes, you will make mistakes. And I would submit that it's not a good career strategy not to be willing to take some risk and make some mistakes. I think that it's, it's and, and in fact, I've, I've had some, some arguments with some private equity guys, or not arguments, but discussions with some private equity guys in other places around the world, and they said, you know what's, what's magical about Americans? And somebody wants to say nice about something about America, I'm always listening. And they said, you know, it's, it's the fact that you, can, that you can try things 
and you can fail, and there's no, there's no taint associated with that. And you, know, you guys have heard the story, you know, Ray Kroc started McDonald's, whatever, at 45 or something after personal bankruptcy. All these guys that have you know, fallen off the horse and then somehow came back and it was a second or third or fourth round that it was really successful. And in a lot of places in the world, if you start a venture and it's not successful, the, 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 the culture and the community is not receptive to you trying again. And it very much is in this culture. Um, and you should take advantage of that and, and, and try some things. So that really was what it was for me. I just couldn't not give this a try because it was, it, it was big. It could be important. I believed in what the, what the mission was. It was um, there were some inherent advantages, I thought, to the organization. And I thought that the disadvantages could be, some could be mitigated. And, and then we could build compensating advantages. Um, so fast forward, I've been there almost five years and built out a big team. And um, I am you know, probably thought of myself, up until the time I went, as much more of a transactional person, capital markets, principal investing. And I probably spend now at least 50% of my time in kind of management and you know, employee motivation and organizational design and organizational alignment and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't know I would enjoy that so much. And I do it from a, you know, having come from a relatively technical background, but um, I've, I've had a chance to, to, to really work on, you know, incentive structures and trying to figure out how to get everybody kind of rowing in the same direction. And it's, um, it's, been, it's been really cool. Um, I just I I didn't give myself many notes because I really want to be much more responsive to things you might want to talk about. But um, you know, one of the other things I think that's that's interesting. One of my observations, um, and that's really what I have. I mean, I I, I will tell you, um, you guys are are better prepared, a lot better prepared than I was at your stage. I mean, it it takes takes me about five minutes of discussions, and I I can see that. I think these master's programs here are. Very, very exciting. Um, they, again, it, it, it plays to the strength of really the, the value proposition of, of, this, of this university and to have a, an intense year in an area of specialty. I mentioned to, to Rita when we were talking, I mean, I didn't used to see many UF people in New York City for the first few years I was there. Every now and then I'd get a call from somebody in Gainesville, hey, how'd you get to New York? And it's kind of, you know, there's got to be a better way than I went because it certainly wasn't, you know, wasn't direct. But um, you know, there there were just more and more um, UF grads that were up there getting, you know, the the best jobs and the best organizations. And a lot of those people were being placed and coming out of these these uh, these you know these these master's programs. And uh, I think they've got a a, a great reputation, and um, it, it's really been a a distinguishing. Um, you know, something that, that as, as we all have to do, you, you kind of, you need to distinguish yourself. You need to stand out a little bit. And I think these programs have, have done that. And we're seeing a lot more of them. A lot of the universities now, you know, looking at Michigan and, you know, all, you know, there's, I think there's eight or 10 universities that have MBA programs that are high quality MBA programs that are supplementing with the, with these types of, of programs. So it's going to be, uh, going to be interesting to see how that, that plays out. But, um, you know, one other observation I have um, is that people kind of peak at different times. And I think back to, to my experience here, and there were probably only a couple of classes my whole time that I felt that I was perhaps the best student in the class. And a lot of the times, I looked around the class and said, I, here's, you know, a woman and two guys, I think, that are better at this subject matter than I am. and. Um, so, you know, it's interesting, I, you know, I wasn't somebody who sat there and, you know, they, they didn't like pull me out of class and say, this is the brightest guy in the class or anything. Um, a lot of it has just been, you know, developing um, a reputation for, you know, for judgment, for integrity. I, I, I sometimes feel like in my career that a little bit of this is that I went out to run, you know, a few miles with some friends and, and people just, keep stopping for some reason. People, some people stop to get something to drink and some people stop to sprain an ankle or whatever it is. And it's like, it's just it's surprising to me 
I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And it just, it seems like every year it kind of thins out a little bit at, at, at the top. And there's good and bad to that. But, um, you know, I would, uh, you know, I would encourage you to, to try to get everything you can out of your classes, out of your classmates. Try to, you know, use the, use the technology and the social media to stay in touch with each other. Share information. Um, a lot of that stuff didn't really exist when I started. One of the things I got out of my MBA program was that we used to have lunch together every day and I just sat around and asked people about their jobs and I'd never met anybody that worked for a consulting firm before and I'd never worked, never met anybody that had worked at a, um, you know, on Wall Street before and I'd never met anybody that worked for a private equity or venture capital startup and I had an opportunity to, and I'm sure you guys, you know, again, you know so much more than I did at the time, but you know, I was in my late 20s and I'm having lunch with people, finding out about those jobs and those experiences and how they got there and, you know, where they went to school and how hard they worked and, you know, how they got somebody to answer a letter and all that kind of stuff. And so don't underestimate the power of sharing the information with each other. And um, the, um, you know, the competition is not across the aisle here. You guys are going to be a source of strength and, and support for each other and the competition's somewhere else and quite frankly most of it's not even in this country at this stage it's somewhere else so um, you know you, you use each other and and support each other and um, you know it's funny I I've had experiences I you know I'll tell one story and and um, you know I, I could tell 50 of these so I got a call I was working in New York I don't know if it was my first or second year and a guy that I know called up and he said would you have lunch with a friend of mine? And I said, well, I guess so, uh, if it's important to you. And he said, yeah, I'd really appreciate it. He's a, he's a commercial banker from Texas, and he's trying to figure out if he wants to go back to graduate school for business. And I just think you'd be a really good person to speak to him. And I said, well, I'll speak to him. I, I, you know, it's nice of you to say. I, I don't know if you, just like I'm the only person that hadn't said no or if you really think that, but anyway, I said, you know, I'll, I'll talk to the guy. So I, I talked to the guy, and. At the time, I was, on, I was doing alumni admissions for the school that I went to, uh, to, to business school. So I, I, I knew a lot about, you know, I had all the facts and figures. And I talked to him about, you know, my, my view of, of, of various schools. And I talked to him about the advantage of, of potential advantages and, and cost of, of going back to business school. And we had a nice lunch, and he thanked me, and off he went. And that was... 20 plus years ago. So um, we have a recruiter in New York that we used to funnel inquiries. We've probably had about 400 inquiries for jobs since I've been in Abu Dhabi and hired, you know, as I said, you know, 100 plus. And um, so they had, I was looking for a senior person with a particular background. And so um, I walk in, you know, I have these interviews that are set up in one hour increments. And so this guy walks in, I said, how are you? He said, fine, how are you? And he says, um, do you remember me? I looked at him and I said, uh, um, I feel like we've met before, but I had no idea. I mean, I wasn't like, it's a, this is somebody from my hometown or somebody from you know, New York or anywhere else. And he said, 20 years ago, you took me to lunch and you talked about the benefit of continuing um, you know, your, your, your education for me, continuing my education. And he said, and you were so enthusiastic about such and such school that um, I actually decided I would apply, and I only made one application. I applied to that school. That's where I went. I got in. I've had this great career internationally all over the world with Lehman Brothers, and things have wound down now. But all of that happened because of the lunch we had. And I said, it wasn't because of the lunch we had. I mean, obviously, you know, you've applied yourself for the last 20 years. And he said, no, but I never would have gone there. I never would have gone back to school if you hadn't have been so enthusiastic about it. I said, I think you're giving me too much credit, but it was, a, it was an interesting moment because it was an hour lunch that I've never thought about since the lunch with a guy I'd never met before, I hadn't talked to in 20 years. So just to kind of tell the end of, end of the story, the glass slipper did fit because he's actually my number two in, uh, in Abu Dhabi today and he works for me. So uh, it's just crazy how those things work. So, you know, help each other. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for help and you'll be surprised you know, what you'll do for somebody and what somebody might do for you that you never would have thought possible. So, um, 
What would you guys like to, to me to talk about? Yes, sir. Boy, that's a great question, I think. I, I can tell you how I approached it, but I'm not suggesting that's the right answer by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I, I might say, I think at times, here I give this big pitch for you know, taking risk, and I think in, I'm, in some ways I'm probably fairly risk adverse. I think of myself as risk adverse as an investor. I think a lot of decisions I've made, I've done it on the basis of the choice that kept the most options open. I've always been interested in, in optionality, and I've always thought that, you know, that the value of being long an option is oftentimes unrecognized or undervalued, and the value of short, you know, being short an option, you know, all of the thrift land, oftentimes is more costly. So I, a lot of times there were paths that I thought kept options open and paths that didn't. And I'll give you an example of this. And I don't know that this is a right, you know, was the right decision. Maybe I missed something terrible or you know, some great opportunity, but I got a job offer. I was in New York and been there for a number of years, and I got a job offer in LA that sounded pretty interesting. And they said, please come out. It was a small kind of second tier financial uh, services, but the, but the job was that they were proposing was designed was pretty cool. So I went out there and I liked the people a lot. I thought I could make a real difference and even went so far as looking at housing and beginning to kind of think about what life would be like. So I was pretty far down the path and uh, all of a sudden, I just kind of woke up at, at one point and I said, I'm not going to take that job. And my wife said, why not? I mean, it, you, you know, we've been talking about it, thinking about it, and now all of a sudden, you don't even want to discuss it. And I said, you know, I think there's a real advantage in, in the finance world to be based in New York if you're going to be in the U.S. And if I lose my job, um, in, in New York, I'll get another one in a month, no problem. I said, if I go to LA and for some reason that doesn't work out, I don't know what we'd do. I said, the people I've talked to that have moved from New York to LA have been happy. And the people that I know that have moved from New York to LA and back to New York have not been happy. There's something about that bounce on the coast that once they go to LA, they make some sort of gear change and then when they come back to New York, somehow it's a little more overwhelming and they begin to miss the weather or some of the other things. So um, not very scientific, but for me staying in New York, you know, there was more optionality in that because of how deep the job market was relative to, and I've had job offers in, you know, Cleveland and Kansas City and places like that. And I've always been a little bit worried about that. So maybe that's not great. I'm not saying New York is a be all to end all, and I think there are a lot of great people that may be a lot happier in Kansas City than New York, but I've always liked the idea of feeling like that I had lots of jobs and lots of places to go, and, and just staying with that theme, I'm, I'm drifting, as I often do from your question, just as things occur to me. I think the day that I went from a being a solid professional to really, really good at what I do was the day that I decided I didn't care. In other words, that I think that, you know, when I started out, I had, you know, in today's dollars, more than 100000 of school debt. I had a pregnant wife. Um, I had no money. My parents weren't in a position to help. Um, I felt a lot of responsibility and I've had a lot of fear about can I support somebody? Can I support a child? I was pretty, you know, kind of afraid. And so I worked really hard. One of the things that, that I was taught was, you know, you can, sometimes you can outwork your competition. So I worked really long hours and worked really hard. Um, you know, maybe, maybe too hard at times. Um, and I worried a lot, and you know, I worried first about paying the rent, and then about making the mortgage payment, and then about putting the kids in the right school as toddlers, and all the way through that one day, I had enough money that I paid off my mortgages, 
and I prepaid uh, money for I have two kids that they both could get all the way through a private school. I kind of figured out what I thought four years of a private school and I put all that money aside and I said, why am I nervous? And I went to the office and I told people what I thought and I, you know, I stood up for things that I believed in and I stood up for things that I thought were not right and I challenged things and, um, you know, I, I challenged the underlying integrity of decisions and the long-term nature of things and whether we were treating other organizations and people as we'd want to be treated because I said, it doesn't matter. I mean, what are they going to do? They're fire me if they don't like, you know, I mean, I just, one day I was able to take all the stuff, the worry and all the fear and everything that I had and I just like drop in a robe. I just was able to like walk out of it and that was a really interesting day and all of a sudden people actually responded to me very differently. It was kind of like I had a new lease on my career and that was a very interesting, you know, point in my life. Now, I'm not saying, I mean, I, I think if I had been more mature or more balanced, maybe I could have come to that person in that position before, you know, I had, was able to check some boxes. I mean, I probably would have been able to check those boxes earlier if I had been able to kind of, you know, grow into that person earlier. But I was, you know, a slow developer, I guess. What else? Yes, ma'am. How has your law degree influenced or benefited your career in real estate and your other ventures? That's a good question. And I, um, I, I've always thought that it helped a lot. Um, I didn't go to law school with the idea that I would necessarily practice law. I thought that it would be a good background for business, and I think that was, was right. Um, I didn't like law school, particularly the first year, uh, near as much as I liked undergraduate. I mean, I didn't have as much fun. You know, I wasn't really somebody that loved sitting in the library, you know, reading eight or nine hours a day kind of thing. So I thought the, the volume of work, and it was a little monotonous, and it was, um, you know, kind of the learning how to learn in law, you go through the first year or so and there's a, there's a process. And that wasn't my favorite, although I think that it was valuable. It was kind of like, you know, my parents used to make me play piano and I, I, um, I was actually a music major here for the first two years at Florida, which is kind of an interesting thing. I played French horn and uh, I decided I didn't have enough music theory and I probably ought to do something I could earn a living uh, doing, but um, I enjoyed it and I was a member of a number of musical organizations and marched at halftime for a few years at uh, Gator Games. Um, but um, I think that, um, I think the training's good. I, I, I had a discussion and I shared this with a group earlier today. Uh, there was a gentleman that's, I think, thinking about law school. There's a debate about whether it's worth three years. You know, if you could go to the first year of law school, you know, I'd say I, I, I would recommend that for anybody in business because I think of, you know, kind of the, the analytical training and stuff that it, that it gives you. I'm not a big fan of the joint MBA JD because you end up losing the core out of both sides. You don't get the, uh, not the core, you, get, you, you lose the elective. So you end up taking the core business curriculum and you end up with a core law school curriculum and that's most of what you have. And so... I got a lot out of law school out of some of the electives and stuff that you kind of take, you know, by your third year, which I wouldn't have been able, been able to do. Um, I had some input from some, some advisors along the way that when I graduated law school, I hadn't done very much in terms of the, um, you know, learning the law that I had, I, it was an educational experience. So um, I ended up practicing law for a few years, even though I, remember what I just said, I didn't go to law school to be a lawyer. I actually did that as an extension of the education. So when I think about my degrees, I think it's about, you know, spending X number of years at Holland and Knight is really just kind of, it, that's how many years law school took. Because I, I had to practice for a while um, and apply it before I really, you know, before it was worth very much. So um, I guess that's a little bit of a lukewarm. I mean, it's, I think it's, I think it has helped me, but I, and, and 
two of, two of the best people that work for me have JDs as well, as well as other, other degrees. So I, 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 don't, I don't think I should be hesitant about it. I mean, it's just, for me, it was somewhat painful and it's costly because it's a lot of years. You know, if you think about three years of giving up income, it's, it's you know, it's the other end of the spectrum from what these, you know, master's degrees will do for you where it's only a year and, you know, you're a new woman or a new man afterwards. There was, did you, in the back, did you have something? Well, um, it's a long way away. It's 7,000 miles. Um, it's 9 to 12 time zones in front of the U.S. It's got a work week that runs Sunday to Thursday. <clears throat> so there are, there are challenges with how it, you know, it, it, it inter interacts with the, with the rest of the world. Um, there... Um, it is wildly multicultural. Now, I think before I went, I thought it was so diverse that that could be a disadvantage. I mean, and, and there are, um, I think Adia has 43, 44 nationalities or something like that. And I just thought that could make for um, a more cumbersome and, and more difficult to kind of reach consensus and do things given the diversity of, the, of that. Um, ironically, going to the second part of your question, you know, anything that maybe is a negative that's a positive, it's one of the things I sell and one of the things I pitch when I'm recruiting. I've got two or three kind of trump cards, and one of it is come, come here, and if you can work with 46 different nationalities and you learn to do that effectively, and you will, and, and, and I don't think we've had you know, we've had probably 99% success rate. You can work anywhere in the world, not just about whether you come back to the state of Florida or whether you come back to, to um, you know, to, to New York or Chicago or whatever it may be, but, you know, you can literally work any, anywhere in the world. I mean, I had, there's only been one job offer that I considered while I've been there, which was a private equity firm that wanted me to run everything outside of the U.S. for them. And so, you know, there were 12 offices, you know, seven in Europe and five in Asia, or four in Asia and one, uh, one in Africa. And, you know, they looked at me and said, you've done a really good job doing what you're doing, and we know you can handle 12 offices in 12 different, um, you know, countries and three different continents. And um, so... One of our investment strategies, we haven't talked too much about that, but it's in, in the real estate side, one of the things we, we look for is kind of global relative value. And, you know, we could have a whole, we could, we could spend the entire time on what that may mean because it can mean any number of things, but it's, it's really looking for mispricing. The challenge of that, I mean, it, it's, it's much easier to come up with, with return expectations um, and the, um, the potential variability of those return expectations, that's a much easier exercise than appropriately risk adjusting that. And, um, you know, and that means sector, it means geography, it means, you know, to business cycle, to, to monetary policy, it can be in the capital stack, is it public private, is it, is it debt equity, and, and so on. So it's many dimensional chess to kind of think out global relative value, but the way we work on that is, um, I spend, I was just tell, telling David, I, I spend a week a month not in Abu Dhabi and not in the Americas, which are my primary responsibility. So every month I spend a week in Russia or China or Asia or India or Singapore or Hong Kong because I have to have the ability to make those judgments, you know, around the world. Now that's me. Well, we bring in managers and we probably have 10 a week, I'm guessing, maybe it's eight or something, but it's, it's not one or two. And if, if the Asia team is working on something, the younger investment professionals on, from the, the European team and the Americas team sit in on that. And so one of the disadvantages of the organization, we try to manage a global business under one roof because if, you know, there's plenty of people that run a global business, but they have offices around the globe and we're doing it under one roof. But it gives us the ability to sit shoulder to shoulder 
and we do meet the whole global team at least four times a week, and, um, and we share everything that we're doing. And so it's really an opportunity to give people a global education, both in terms of you know, capital flows around the globe, the investment decisions, the, the various legal structures, tax structures, that type of stuff, and the soft skills, all the cultural stuff. You know, how, you know, some guys were trying to put something together, a Pan-Asia thing, and you know, they, they, they called a meeting in, um, one of the younger guys set up a meeting in, in Beijing. And guess what? The Koreans didn't want to come. The Japanese didn't want to come. We're like, you know, if you're looking for a pan Asian, why did you pick one of the countries that there's going to be some, you know, some, some resistance to? And he said, well, what do I do? He said, how about Hong Kong? How about Singapore? I mean, there's, you know, we've got safe places to do this. And made a change, and all of a sudden the receptivity, you know, changed. And just little things like that that sound like nothing, but they're, they're a difference in whether you get the right people in the room, whether they're listening to you, whether they have the right attitude when they get there. And so um, I thought that that was going to be really, really difficult. And actually, it's turned out to be, again, one of the greatest pieces of, of, of my education. I mean, I've done a little bit of stuff internationally, but it's up, you know, 50-fold since I've been there. Sure. So. Well, just a little more technical question you kind of alluded to it earlier. Um, as, a, as a sovereign wealth plan, it sort of has its own view. I'm not certain exactly who you were holding the fiduciary duty to, but without kind of knowing that, how would you set up sort of an internal benchmark as to what you want to raise your return to be your own well, it's a good question, and, and the, the, the time that that question occurred to me was when I was interviewing. And I was deep in the interview. It seemed like they were very interested in me, and it seemed like there'd be a lot to work with, and it seemed like the role would be pretty cool. And I asked, I said, you know, let's talk about the al allocation. Let's talk about your kind of your, your risk budget, your risk tolerance. How do you think about it? What are your return expectations? And I didn't get a good answer. And I tried it a couple of ways. And um, really, they weren't biting. I wasn't getting much of a, you know, and, and, and I was frustrated. I'm like, you know, if, if, you know if, if you were interviewing there and you asked that question and I said, I'm not going to tell you, you know, that wouldn't be a good thing. You know, you're kind of saying, that doesn't feel right to me. So I said, look, maybe I'm not communicating well. So I said, let me try, to, try it again. So I said, let me ask it this way. If you were very happy with what we did and you considered it very, very successful a year or two or three years down the road, what would that look like? What would it, you know, what, what metric are you using to evaluate success? Because it just wasn't, you know, kind of wasn't coming out. And literally the answer to that question at the time was, we want you to help us figure that out. And I said, well, do you have any liability streams that need to be matched? You know, thinking about the, 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 uh, the, public, um, the public and corporate, you know, pension rule. No, we don't. Are you required to provide liquidity to any source? Yes. Oh, wait. Oh, really? Yes? Tell me about that. Well, we don't look to the alternatives for that, but we do have a, you know, we, we, we basically have a mechanism by which we increase and, and, and decrease the money supply in, in, in the country, and they kind of sized it. So I'm like, all right, well, that's tolerable, and it that, you know, they wouldn't need real estate or private equity or infrastructure to do that. So, okay. So it sounds like we don't need anything. I said, so um, how, how have the returns been historically? Because I thought, you know, I'll just get a number. How many points do they score? And, you know, do I think I can score more points? He's like, well, we don't really disclose that. So I'm saying, this isn't going well. I thought, I thought it was going, going pretty well. And... Uh, about this time, the call to prayer is going off, and I can't even hear the guy I'm talking to, you know, because it's like, it's, it's like really loud. Um, it's down the, down the road. But, um, and it's already gotten, it's already become dark. But um, we, we have decided that we would, that we would, there would be a degree of discovery about that. In other words, I, I won't say that that, that question were, were fully answered, but what we did establish was they were very clear on the mandate. They said, what we're trying to do is we're trying to preserve the long-term prosperity of our citizens. I said, okay. 
So it sounds generational. And because I'm a real estate person, the first thing that kind of clicks in my head, it sounds like a family office to me. It sounds like what I, what I would hear from, you know, the Rudens in New York City or, or you know, whatever. It's, you know, it's the idea of, you know, I'm, I'm less concerned about today and I'm more concerned about the kids, the grandkids, and the great-grandkids kind of thing. So it's a little bit of that. I said, all right, well, we're, you know, the source of funding, or we have a fixed, you know, and we got into that, and it was, it's, a, it's a percentage of the oil revenues, and I ultimately, you know, was able to tear out of them kind of how the formula works. Um, so it is a growing pool, and it's a, they don't disclose the amount, but it's in the hundreds of billions, so it's large. Um, so then my fear was, and I go back to a little risk aversion, I'm like, well, this is 2000, early 2009 when I'm having this conversation with them, and there's a lot of um, displacement in the markets. And I said, what about the requirement to invest? Because I was very afraid. I've, I've seen a lot of public funds that have these mandates that they're going to go invest in blank, and they, they decide to do that without either good access points or at the wrong point in the cycle, and it can be devastating. So I was very fearful. I said, what happens if I want to make the decision that we don't invest a penny for a year? They said, that's fine. I said, you're sure? They said, yeah, that's fine. So there was a sense of patience. There was a sense of kind of a, a long-term perspective, and it's really more of an, you know, an, uh, an end value optimization exercise. Uh, and they do have a tolerance for shorter-term volatility. You know, I mean, they don't, we're not marking to market, so it's not like you have to worry about, you know, short-term pricing volatility and, and those type of things. So that only partially answers your question, and, and it took us a few years um, to come up with, you know, how we think about return, return profile. I mean, there is a benchmark. Um, it's an IPD-based benchmark. It's woefully inadequate. Um, it doesn't, I don't, I mean, you know, if you think about benchmarks, um, you know, in the alternative world, it, they, it fails all the Bailey criteria, you know. I mean, it's not investable and it's not, you know, identifiable in advance and, you know, you kind of go through the list. So it's, uh, but there's a lot of new science in kind of how you think about it. I don't know, do you guys spend time on that in your classes? Is that kind of the, kind of the new measures of risk in alternatives in the private, you know, on the private side? Um, I think it's a fascinating area. I just did, um, I obviously can't stop this school stuff, but I just, I just did, I did a, you know, CFA like, you know, forever ago, uh, but um, I just did the Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst Program, which is a, you can do it in a year, and there's a lot of, lot of focus on um, kind of the, you know, the, the, the third and fourth moments and various measures of risk and stuff. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. So if anybody's interested, particularly in real estate, I think it'd be a great, great thing to do. I'd almost argue for it uh, more than a CFA, just in terms of kind of background. It's very easy, very easy to do. It's just, you can literally do it in nine months. There's exam, two exams and they're six months apart. Um, but um, but what, we, what we try to do is come up with a diversification within the class. So we have, um, we're invested in 20 some odd countries, 23, 24, something like that. We revisited recently whether we thought we were in too many or too few. It was a very interesting exercise. We looked at, I think, 194 countries and gave some thought to, you know, would we want to be in one country or 194? Or what would be the right number? And there was a little bit of, you know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears that, that you, could, you could be at it, you know, it, the porch could either be too hot or too cold. Um, if, you, if you thought one country provided the best risk-adjusted returns, you could say, well, why not put all of your capital in that? Um, it's going to be sufficiently diversified by the balance of your global portfolio outside of the real estate class. But um, you're not taking advantage of the, of the differing of business cycles and monetary cycles, so you're, you know, you're, you're, you're taking a very, very narrow opportunity set. On the other hand, if you, let's say, 
decided you were going to charge after 75 countries or 100 countries, you're really watering down your focus and resources, and you're not going to be able to do things in enough scale in, in, in certain countries, and you're going to lose some of the advantages, or at least we thought we'd lose some of the advantages that, that we had. So we actually have, um, I think it, you know, we have 70 ish percent or something of our portfolio in like five countries. And then, you know, diversifying component with the others. And we, we really, it's, it's, it's not a, we could invest in something other than the 33, and we don't have to invest in all the 33. It is a guide, not a, not a mandate. But it helps us um, allocate resources, um, you know, figure out kind of where to look. We don't know where we're going to find the opportunity, but it at least gives us a hint where to look. Well, <laughs> I see those as two different questions, and I'll tell you why. Do we have a benchmark? Yes, because there's a strategy unit that's a, that's a macro um, risk return optimization black box, and they like to see it. And I don't believe much in it, but we do have one, and it's IPD-based. It's, there's, there's, they group the portfolio in two pieces, and one's IPD flat and one's IPD plus 300. So the, what it is, it depends on what the weighting of the two. But it's IPD plus something, you know. I might just quickly explain what IPD is. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a, this is a global property index. It was much better in, outside of the U.S. Than, than, than in the U.S., but they've been very active um, in, in increasing their data. This is... Uh, Institutional real estate, I think generally it would be about 70% core and 20, 25% value add, just in terms of kind of weighting, tends to be larger, uh, larger city. A, a little bit of a, you know, international NACREF, if, if NACREF is more familiar to you. Um, but... It's, it's just a placeholder. I mean, I think we should be doing something different. That was the first half of your question, and I said that because that, that's almost more imposed on us than what we use. And then what was the second half? Uh, the second half was just, what? I mean, obviously there's less that can disclose, and so I was just saying, you know, just trying to get a feel for what is it quantifiably what you're seeking. Well, it's... <laughs> It's good, it's good returns based on the risk. And I had a problem with something recently that we had a debt program, and we have a number of debt programs that we've established. I had never invested in real estate debt before I got there, and it took me about two years to convince them and to get the structure. We're finally using 892 structures, and we're finally using domestically controlled reason. We finally kind of modernized the, the way, and we're taking you know, better advantage of, of, of structuring techniques and stuff that have been available that just hadn't, hadn't been used. But... Um, you know, we, we'll do ground up development spec. I mean, we're doing a development on a ground lease, 40 year ground lease with the Chinese government in Shanghai and there's no precedent of what happens at the end of a ground lease. So you may get nothing and, you know, the building is, um, the building's probably gonna run 1.4 billion fully spec. Um, so we can get pretty far out the risk spectrum and then on the other end of the spectrum, we've got these debt programs, and most of the debt programs we have are second or mezzanine or something. So they would be in, let's say, a, a, a 35, just roughly 35 to 70 percent corridor. So you've got 30 percent subordination, and you have a, a, a preference in terms of a cash flow to a senior lender or participation in some structure. But you're sitting in kind of that middle area, and. We've done a fair amount of that lending over the last couple of years at 10s, 11, 12% kind of returns in, in that stuff. I had another program that we're doing that was first mortgage debt, and it was zero to 70, so it was, there was nothing in front of it. And, and um, you know, you're making, if you're making a, um, you know, if you're, I, th I think we're generally, the stuff we're doing, and there's a reason we were able to get these returns, but it's probably seven and a half, seven and three quarter kind of percent on that and a bunch of people kept saying this isn't a good program you know this is this is one of our lowest yielding investments that we had I said but guys you understand we're making seven and a half percent not on the 35th percent LTV and the 36 and the 37 and 38 you know the average of the 35 to 70 but it's the 1 percent LTV and the 2 percent LTV and 
I don't know if they just, you know, aren't used to security pricing, whatever, but there were a few people that just, just struggled with that, you know, and they thought it was a, a, a sub-performing program. So I decided to package it differently, and I had a little training seminar, and I brought everybody and all the critics in, and we put a, um, a debt facility on the whole thing at LIBOR plus 200, and we leveraged our at 50% advance, and so now we've got the 35 to 70% corridor, and we put that, I think it pushed it into like 11.5 or 11.6, and we've, we've got it in a structure that's virtually tax-free, so the 11.6 is both a pre-tax and a post-tax. It's about 2 or 3% tax leakage, but just for the sake of simplicity, let's just say it's just tax-free. And so I grossed it up and I said, all right, if we're actually doing equity in a U U.S. state that we've got state as well as federal taxation and we gross it up, and basically it, it was equivalent pre-tax to like a 16 and change. So you want to go out and buy a piece of real estate and make 16% on it and you put it through the mix master, through the, you know, through the tax, risk adjustment, all that, and it comes back to, and it's really about equivalent to the 7.5% we're getting on the 0 to 70. And they all kind of left the room kind of going, oh, wow. And that happened just in the last couple of months. So there has been a lot of educational process, you know, about what we're doing. So, you know, we're doing first mortgage loans all the way out to spec development in, you know, in, in huge size. So there's an expectation, you know, it's almost like an efficient frontier. You're looking for the stuff that's, you know, that's, that, 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 that kind of is off the line, if you will. So we're, we're you know, we want to buy, you know, we want to buy cheap and, and uh, hold the stuff that's persistent and sell the stuff when it's overpriced. And um, got a lot of positions and I've got at least two people on every position we have around the globe. That's why we have, one of the reasons we have so many people and they have to revisit this stuff at least quarterly. And you know, I have a recommendation of, if you said, what do you think you might sell in 2014? I can tell you what the 40 positions are and what are you gonna finance or refinance? I can show you those 35 or whatever. It may not be completely right, but I mean, we have a business plan that it's kind of what we spend January doing and, and um, we'll see, hopefully we, we get some of that right. Yes, sir. Yes? <laughs> uh, you're not going to let me get away with that, I bet. Um, there's a whole bunch of ways to, to, to answer that. Um, I would start by saying, you know, taking sovereign wealth from a Middle Eastern company, uh, country, we are a emerging country in our own, in our own right. So um, I have a hypothesis, no one's ever completely admitted this, that we have a bit of a soft spot for emerging economies. And if you look at our equities position, you look at some of the sovereign credits and stuff we hold, there does seem to be a bent towards you know, emerging economies. Um, so yes, we do, we, you know, we, we do do quite a bit of that. Um, real estate's a funny asset because it is, um, it is often financed aggressively. And so the debt capital markets, um, you know, can, can tell you a fair amount. I mean, one of the reasons, one of my arguments for getting into lending business as well as we do borrow, uh, which may sound somewhat inconsistent, but I want to keep a very active lending business around the world because I want the information that the origination of all those loans provides. Um, and um, so, you know, the two ways I can tell everybody in the, in the room how to be, you know, billionaires really fast. You only need to be able to do one of two things. If you can predict the direction of interest rates, um, you, can, uh, you, know, you, can, you can make a lot of money. But, of course, no one's proved to be able to do that consistently for very long. And then, you know, uh, well, I'd throw currencies in there. Uh, and then, you know, thirdly, if you could predict capital flows, you know, if you could really, because I've had glimpses of being able to front run capital flows and it's easy money when you can do it. I mean, something as silly as I was at Credit Suisse um, as, a, as a principal of a real estate investment vehicle when a guy, I don't know if you guys would remember this name, but Andy Stone was, a, um, was kind of a, a, a maverick and a very high risk lender that put out a ton of money. Ethan Penner at Nomura was like the first of that breed and then Andy Stone was the, was the second. 
Um, and Andy gave a big speech that people weren't loaning in downtown Manhattan. And he wanted, every, he wanted everybody to go out and find money, you know, find bars in downtown Manhattan and get some money out because there's nothing wrong with downtown and go, go lend. Also in that same speech, he said something kind of shocking. He asked, he had been at, at Credit Suisse for about three months or four months at the time, and he asked his team, it's probably about this size, and he said, who's made a loan since I've been here that's defaulted? I was kind of looking at him, what? I mean, there, and then people start looking at each other, and he said, Is, has anybody made a loan here that's gone bad since I've been here? No one was admitting to that, whether they had or hadn't. And he goes, you guys aren't aggressive enough. And I'm like, it blew my mind, because I'm like, even the worst of loans don't generally blow up in the first couple of months. I mean, there may be an interest reserve or something. I mean, it's just, it was mind-boggling. So this same guy that said, we're just going to blow money, you know, you should, you, sh you should take risk and you should make loans that blow up or you're not lending enough. And by the way, we're going to target downtown. So I heard that. I race, I go home. I raced downtown. I bought everything I could find. And it did fantastic. Because when that debt capital flow showed up like 90 days later, all the values of I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was, you know, kind of mind-boggling. So watching the, you know, the lending systems and the legal systems in countries matter a lot because, you know, if I told you I had a crystal ball and you could be sure that the U.S. was going to grow at 3% and I could tell you what was going to happen to office rates and, you know, I could tell you what's, what was going to happen to the average uh, uh, that the average uh, square, you know, square footage demand in the U.S. per worker, and I had some insight into what was going to happen to the workforce structurally, blah, blah, blah. You know, you know, and let's assume you could bank on 3% for that, you know, kind of on the, you know. And I said, and, and by the way, I've got an emerging market, and I can guarantee you 5 or guarantee you 6 at the fundamental level. Does the 6 sound better or the 5 sound better than the 3? Well, before you answer that, what if I tell you that the U.S. has a very, very developed, you know, uh, lending market, the debt capital markets are, are, are very mature in, in the U.S., and wherever that had that five and six, there's no lending. There's no, you know, there's, there's no borrowing. It can only be done synthetically, if at all. You know, it, it becomes a very different proposition because, you know, what's happening at the, the you know, the kind of the, the, the net value per square foot or per square meter per year you know, on the space is one thing, but how that translates down to kind of what the returns look like on the equity can be, you know, can be very different. So, um, yeah, we have a, you know, we definitely have a view on a lot of, you know, a lot of markets. We're really not, um, we're not making market bets. I mean, what the, our view of markets is a little bit like determining the direction of the wind. I mean, you still might be able to run fast if you're running against the wind, and you still may be a klutz if you're running with the wind behind you. So, the individual investments are more idiosyncratic and specific, and they can be kind of exceptions to the rule. I was on a, uh, giving a talk in New York, and there were some people really trying to say, but what's the right geography and what's the right sector to invest in? And I don't think you can successfully do that. I mean, you can, you can back solve for it, but it's very difficult to do that. Um, and people talk about, everybody loves either the clock or they love these things that kind of show the, you know, the, the business cycle um, or the fundamental cycle for real estate. And, you know, the second stage does follow the first and the third follows the second. But it's still, you know, it, it's still not applied science because what people don't know is the term and they don't know the magnitude. You know, I mean, everybody that I knew before the global crisis thought that there was going to be you know, a, a, a little bit of a, you know, catching one's breath. And some people even said it's going to, you know, things could be negative. I actually gave a few speeches and I predicted at the time that housing was going to reset in America. And a number of people came to me and said, you know, you did a pretty good job of the speech, but that was really a stunt. I said, I believe it. And they said, no, you don't. I said, I do believe it. And they said, well, you know, we haven't had four consecutive quarters of housing price declines since the Great Depression. And the Fed will not let housing reset because it's too important to the consumer. The consumer represents two-thirds of the economy. It can't happen. Um, but obviously something happened. And so, but I don't know anybody, you know, uh, I, I didn't participate in the big short, but I don't know, I don't know anybody, and I, you know, I was a partner of John Snow, the former Secretary of the Treasury and so on. I don't know anybody 
that predicted the magnitude of what happened. You know, so I don't think uh, I don't think the chart with the with the clock or the chart with the with the wave on it, you know, did much for anybody that I could see. But anyway, I'm gonna have trouble getting a teaching job here. I bet. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, what else? Yes? You mentioned that uh, 70% of the proposed election. This is my Russian friend because I'm going to Moscow in a few days, so he's prepping me, but go ahead. 70% of the portfolio uh, is invested in about five countries. What are these countries if it's disclosable? Like? US, UK, Australia, France, and China. What do you think about Germany? Um, I know a lot of investors that would be in their top five. It just depends on one's access. We had a really strong, our, our French expertise on our, um, on our uh, investment team is very, very strong. Um, and um, we're not as deep yet in, uh, in Germany and we're trying to build that out. But it's, you know, it's a, um, yeah, it's a market we were, we're under, underweighted to and we'd love to do more in Germany and building out the staffing to, to be able to do it. What other cities in China? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah, are, you, are you limiting your question to China or outside of China? China. Oh, China. Well, I think we're in... Um, trying to think, eleven cities in China. Um, so we're, we're we're pretty active in China. It depends on the property type. The office development is in limited to Shanghai and in Beijing, but we have retail uh, in a number of, of um, you know second tier cities. You know, I, I get such a kick out of using that term. So a second tier city in China is bigger than New York City. So you know this is like eleven million people. You know these are the, the second second tier. Um, the first time I went to China with, other than just our Asia team, I took a couple guys from the America team, and we had this city center retail that had a, um, actually every, I think every retail we own in China has a Walmart in it. Um, and, um, but um, it, was a, it was in the, you know, it was, it was an old kind of rundown um, center. The ground floor had the, I've forgotten the term, the little, the little shops, you know, the, the family shops that are this big. Uh, they're almost like kiosks. There's a term for it, but I'm drawing a blank in, in China. But, um, and I asked my team, I said, guys, so what do you think about this investment? And they go, there's a lot of people in China. <laughs> I said, you don't get to fly all the way here, and that's your observation. So you got you to gotta do better than that. But, um, but yeah, so retail, we're doing uh, in, in, in uh, a number of places, and then also industrial and logistics. Um, are, are two property types that were, um, we've, got a, we've got a program with uh, Prologis in China that we've got over a billion of equity in, in um, industrial development, and logistic development, and then uh, several managers on the, on the retail side. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the growth prospects in China are, you know, are staggering, and we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of uh, Chinese and probably, I mean, even some of my America team are Mandarin speakers. Um, did you have a question or were you just, just stretching there? <laughs> but you do have a question, I bet. Um, what else? Please. Um, talk a lot about Um, it's a good question. Um, I think that uh, I have this philosophy that if you took every problem in the world, I don't mean business, I, every problem that you could possibly come up with, about 90% of them could be traced back to either a communication issue or ego. So I think that if, if, you, if you can stay humble and if you can keep encourage people around you to stay humble 
and you can learn to effectively communicate with each other, and I think that's maybe harder than the first one, um, I think that goes a long way. Um, if you ask me personally, I mean, that, that would be generic advice. I mean, for me, um, I have the ability to be very empathetic with people. Um, you know, if I have to deliver bad news, I, it hurts me more than the person that, you know, that I'm communicating it to. And I like people, and I think it's one of the reasons I like my job. I like to travel. I like to get to know people all over the world and, um, and, and, and try to relate to them and find ways to, you know, to connect um, so I think that's, I, I think that's part of it. Um, you know, I've, I've worked on it some, um, Adia sent me back to, a. um, there's like a, there's old man college that, um, there's a, there's a, um, there's a university that has, has, has a huge executive education offering and they have three comprehensive leadership programs and one is kind of for like the mid-career 30 to you know 30 35 ish high 30s there's one that's kind of a 40s to, to low 50s and, and there's one that's for um, you know more mature managers and it's really intense it's a couple of months you know they put you back in a dorm and Adi actually sent me last year and so we spent um, we did 173 cases, business school cases, um, in eight weeks. So we did the curriculum that their, their MBA students do over four semesters. We did it in eight weeks, um, six and a half days a week. But there was a lot of, um, lot of work on the people skills and the organizational stuff. That was a big help. I, I was at a stage that, you know, I was... I probably had gone about as far as I could go without getting a little bit of a little bit of training, and um, I actually have a coach. I um, I have a an Australian guy that I spend some time with, and um, you know, it's you're never too old to learn, and you know, I, I'm um, it's something I work at all you know all the time. But uh, you know, one of the things we do is. The cultural fit matters a lot. So, um, you know, we've passed on some really talented people that are a bit of prima donnas. And, you know, we, we look for people that want to work with other people and people that want to, you know, share success and, 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 and share failure. And so some of that's on, you know, kind of the identification of the personality. And, and when I first started, um, I was telling some of the folks, you know, early, early today that I, I built my part of the organization from the ground up. They were absolutely convinced I was going to start with the senior people and kind of fill it out, you know, top to bottom. And I did exactly the opposite. I went and got three and four year, like, you know, talent that were brilliant and then, and then, you know, kind of worked my way up. So the interesting thing about that is every time I was hiring people, I was bringing people in at a level that they were going to be the boss or, you know, one step higher on the totem pole than the people that were interviewing them because of the way I started from the, you know, from the bottom. And at first, what I did was I gave everybody a, um, an anonymous black ball. So everybody on the team met everybody that was, anybody that would have come in potentially senior, and I gave them an option that they could basically, um, you know, deep six that person. And I'm trying to think if it, if it even ever got used, but just the fact that I gave it, you know, people were relaxed. It wasn't like they felt like somebody was gonna come in because they felt like they had control and influence and, and true input on it. Um, and I don't think it ever was fully exercised. You know, one time somebody used it said, I'm tempted to use it and here's my reservation. And so it was like a threat of using it. They didn't actually, you know, pull it. I said, you know, this can be an, you know, anonymous. You don't even have to do it that way. And they said, no, I want, I want to start the conversation. And they just kind of threatened it. And we talked it through and didn't end up, you know, it, it was enough. We collectively as a group decided not to pursue that person. So, but there, you know, something like that comes up. And I'm dealing with something like that every day, it seems like, you know. And that's now the piece of my job that's become really fascinating in the things that I'm learning the most about. I just 
want to throw in the, I got a go in here. I'm not a student, but, uh, I was interested to hear what you had to say about uh, the future of Class A office. I mean, I see. It. Are you the parent of a student? <laughs> I'm the parent of this fine young gentleman right here. Is that Devin, buddy? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I heard rumor. Okay. <laughs> Very good. But, um, you know, uh, my background's civil engineering with heavy commercial and resort construction all my life, so construction and development. But uh, as I saw, I used to do Class A in, in L.A. before the crash in 85. And, and, um, but as you mentioned, logistics, and I've been looking at that years ago, as you know, I see the shrinkage of retail, the growth of logistics, the industrial, the new products, the just-in-time. So the malls have changed. I've seen, you know, big transition in malls in my career, big transition in Class A. And I see these young children <laughs> who are brilliant. And getting better training than, than I ever did. I feel um, the same way. And, and I don't feel like they're going to report to the cubicles like we did. You know? And as, and as I, but I still see capital flowing into <coughs> Class A office buildings in certain markets. And it, and it surprises me. And I'm wondering, is it, is it true in, in the U.S. more so than other countries? Or do you see a general kind of shrinkage of Class A um, opportunities, increase in some other type of call it shingle mixed use, um, and, and also, with, you know, I don't want to confuse the class A with, with the retail, but the same kind of thing applies. The mall will get smaller, and the logistics and industrial will get larger. So, so what's the what's the counteract to the shrinkage of the class A? What happens, you know, ha how do you replace offices? Is it going to the home office? I mean, I see like Yahoo, big technology firm, you know, getting away from letting people telecommute if you so where do you see that in the U.S. as opposed to other countries? So when you talk about the shrinkage of Class A, because I think sometimes we, we talk about, we use terms that are, we kind of all know approximately what we're talking about, but it's important, I think, to, to, to really tie down. Are you talking about the demand yeah. for the, cl the best office space? Well, the demand for large Class A office buildings. I mean, obviously in China, it's not the case. They're building them bigger, higher, you know, larger. But in the U.S., I don't see... New class A being developed, I don't see um, the, you know, the So now are you talking about demand or are you talking about supply or is there an assumption that the supply is, is, is following the demand? Well, obviously supply follows demand typically, sometimes too late, sometimes too early. Well, supply usually follows the available capital. Most developers I know will well, build it whether anybody sure needs it or not if somebody will yeah, yeah. fund it for them. But, um, well, you know, I, I don't know. Let me, let me start at a different place and see if this gets us to anything that would approach answering your question. Um, the way people shop is changing, and the way people office is changing. Um, and the question is, how adaptable is the space for the change in use, and how long does it take before there's any sort of disconnect? So I look at New York City, for example, because let's just take that, because it's our big, big US city. So there's been very, very little new office product delivered for almost 40 years, between 35 and 40 years, right? Um, and, and sometimes people come from other markets and they're very surprised because everybody's heard of New York and New York, you know, New York. And they go there and they look at the office space and they say, this Avenue of the America stuff, this Park Avenue, this, this, is, your, this is your good stuff kind of thing? It's a little bit like, you know, they, they can hardly believe it. Um, and then we explain, well, look, it sits over a, um, you know, an escalator system that ties into Grand Central, so it's more to do with location, blah, blah, blah. But, they, but, but, but look at it, it's really not that nice. And then, you know, you talk about what is the good stuff? Is it, is it GM building? Is it Nine West? Is it Seagram's or whatever? So we just bought, um, this a closing dinner Monday night, in fact, the, uh, the office condominium, 1.1 million square feet of the um, Time Warner Center. And Time Warner, uh, just acquired by Comcast, you may have saw seeing the announcement. Um, but they're going to be there, and then they're going to vacate five years for it. So we have a reasonable yield that we're satisfied with five years. And then we've got a 1.1 million square feet of a five-use industrial building with permanent Park Avenue views, the ability to rename it, and it's space with really 13-foot slab to slab. So we can make that space in the office for the 21st century. And the place that I get the most nervous about U.S. office, for example, is when I go to Australia. 
because four, three of the four big accounting firms and four of the four big banks all have open floor plans like I've never seen in the U.S. It's certainly in front of anything that I'm seeing in Silicon Valley. And these a lot of technology. Um, everybody's uh, building ID is coded for who they are, what their typical hour profile is, and what part of the building they occupy. And so it's a smart, it's a smart building. And they'll have, um, you know, I'll use round numbers. Maybe they have uh, 350 seats and 500 employees. So if everybody showed up on the same day, they couldn't even all be in the space. But it works very well. And if they, um, you know, if, if, if 320 of the seats fill up, everybody gets an email on their iPhone or their, or their Galaxy or whatever they're using that says, you know, there's 20 seats and they tend to be in this and this and this division. They, um, every tenant is completely cognizant of the um, building efficiency. Even leases there say if the, if the energy efficiency of a building drops below a certain level, the tenant gets a break. You barely see that here. So I look at Australia and I say they are a decade ahead of us in the U.S., easy. And so when people talk about office in the U.S., I get nervous because, you know, you skate to where the puck's going to be, not to where it is right now or where it used to be. So this idea, you've got to, you've got to kind of stay in front of that and how adaptable is, is, is that space. I mean, if you think about facilities of a, you know, of a university and how you manage those and how you create you know, better efficiencies so that you're not using them. I mean, the, the, this stuff is, you know, is, is fascinating. Um, we, we just made a big bet. We just bought eight towers um, in um, one of the Western markets that I think you know. And um, all the big tenants had, um, had, had downsized. All the big banks and accounting firms out there had gone from 210 square feet for occupied employee to, you know, 170 or whatever it was. And so they had significantly downsized. And we went through and basically polled, surveyed almost all the major tenants, and we felt like they were largely done with that. In other words, our bet is that they're not going to take it from 170 to 140 or something. Maybe we'll be wrong. But so we bought a yield that we were satisfied with net of the downsizing, and it was significant. You know, probably, you know, the accounting firms probably gave up 25% of their space or whatever. But our view is that they're close to touching bottom on that and that, that we can take advantage of a renaissance and there's, there's a ton of residential uh, and, and other things that are, that are going in that market. So that's, you know, that, that's the bet. But um, I think there's ways to, you know, there, there's ways, there's, there's strategies around, you know, how to invest in this stuff. I mean, we're, if you looked at our strategy, we're, you know, on, in specific buildings, we're interested in trying to sell some of what we consider to be kind of commodity core because we think it would be, um, it could be influenced by just what you talked about, just the, the general user that doesn't really care. But I think if you have Central Park views, I think if you sit above Grand Central Station, I think if you sit on the Hudson River or the East River and you have fantastic views, I think those are much more insulated from the commodity core risk of, of demand. So it, I think this is a good thing for real estate professionals because what I would say is that you're, you're, if you have the ability to be a better stock picker or investment picker, it's going to have a, a better value. The idea that you can just generically move into things is, you know, it, that's kind of run its course, but there's still... Um, and, and we've done a lot of research. I mean, we, we've got research guys, and we spent a lot of time saying, what are attributes of buildings that allow them to outperform their peer set? And, you know, park views is one of them, I'll tell you. The premium for park views would, would shock you if you saw it. I mean, we, we've looked over, you know, 50 projects or 60 projects and things like that. So, you know, what does it have to offer? What's different, you know? Um, did I cover some of that, most of that? Yeah. Okay. I've got to tell you a little story. Uh, yesterday, about uh, mid-afternoon, I uh, found a uh, message that all of his flights had been canceled. And uh, 21 hours, three, nine, three hours of sleep later, and by the way, of Houston, uh, he made it to his presentation. I think that says something about the way he goes about his business. 
I want to tell you, Tom, no, thank you. Well, thank you. It's great, great to be here. Thank you.